Here's Victor Brandt. He's emerged as the leader of the organized workers. They've been taking away our jobs and giving them to illegal wetbacks what they've been bringing across the border. And while we've been starving, that man's been getting fat on us. Frank is responsible. Get that tank. Come on. Hank, the first man that puts a foot across that line, you shoot him. Come on, Hank. disguised as social protest or excused as law and order is so much a part of our world today that it's almost become a way of life. We've become immune to violence. We've lost our sense of outrage. Calmly accepting what we should passionately reject. If as lawyers we're to protect freedom, we must reject violence. If we're to ensure justice to every man, we must use the system to improve the system. Thank you. I'm Maggie Lawson, Mr. Mason. And I want you to know that that's a great speech if you're in Beverly Hills. But we're in the real world out here. I've got a client in Greenbrier, three days away from a murder trial. He's poor, he's uneducated, he's scared. It's that kind of desperation that forces a guy to turn to violence. As a practicing attorney, surely you're not advocating the use of violence? Not advocating. Recognizing that, at least in my client's place, violence will make the world notice. What else is he going to turn to? Well, he should be able to turn to you. Is he as angry as you are? After 63 years, 40 of it right here in this valley, I got myself uh, some pretty good friends house, it's half mine, and 
some Social Security coming. But that's about the size of it. I ain't mad at nobody. Now you're not, but what about your son? Maggie says... Lenny? He and that big mouth Vic he runs with are both bitter and cold. You can't blame Lenny for being bitter. Frank Hayden did send you to jail for something you didn't do. Why did Hayden accuse you of stealing, Grady? Well, somebody took off with $200 of his money. I was around where the money was kept. I've been uh, office janitor out there for the last couple of years since I busted this leg in the field. Hayden accused me of taking it. We argued about it. He called the law, and I got 90 days. When did you get out? At 4 in the afternoon on the 7th. Five hours later, Hayden was killed. Why did you go out there that night? Ask Hayden for my job back. You wanted to go back to work for the man who sent you to jail for something you didn't do? An old buck like me with a busted leg, who else is going to hire him? Tell me exactly what happened that night. I watched Hayden go in. Then I waited for a while outside his office. I heard two shots. I run in, raised up his head, and he was gone. I was making it for the fence with that dog biting at me, and when I got up on the fence, somebody put a bullet right here inside my head. I figured that's about time to quit and give up. That's what I did. Grady, I still don't understand why you went out there or how you could expect Hayden to hire you. I don't expect you to understand. You've never been old and dirt poor. But I'll tell you something, Mr. Mason. When you are, you get scared. So scared that you convince yourself you can live without pride. Grady, Maggie has asked me to work with her on your case. Now, if you want me, I'll stay. And we'll fight this out. <laughs> what difference does it make? They ain't never gonna let me out of here anyway. Get checked into your rooms, I'll park the car. Just drive. Kidnapping? Kidnapping? No way. You and me just took a little ride, that's all. Your word against mine. Now, Mr. Mason. All I want from you is some cooperation. Me and my friends, we're not gonna let Grady take that rap. Thanks. But I don't try cases with the committee. You see, now, that's just exactly why we want you to go back where you belong and butt out of our business. Why is Grady Cobb's case your business? Because he's one of our people and because we're also prepared to tear down that courthouse if that's what it takes to get Grady out. All it takes to get Grady out is a fair trial. You know the best defense that Maggie Larson and I can give him? He'll be judged by a jury of his peers. They will determine the outcome, not you. Not your friends. Not your guns, you understand? Yeah. <laughs> but you don't. I've said my piece. Let's roll. You knew it wasn't loaded, didn't you? Hey, uh, you're not gonna leave me out here, are you? Yeah, I'm gonna leave you here. Okay, Daddy, but I gave you your chance, and you blew it. But Vic's harmless. Wheeling a gun, kidnapping, conspiring to obstruct justice, you say is harmless. Would you have talked to him if he hadn't held a gun on you? Probably not, at least not then and there. See what a little violence will accomplish? When it comes to Brandt, I advocate a little violence. Terry, look, I know Vic. Do you know him well enough to find out what he's up to? Why he doesn't want me here? You expect me to act like a... I expect you to act like a lawyer. I expect you to do whatever you can legally do to protect your client. And I expect you to face up to what I told you you'd find here. The real world. Maggie. Where guys like Vic who've scratched for bread all their lives make their own rules. 
Look, I don't know what he's going to do, but it's not going to be your style. And if it'll help free Grady, I'm for it. Maggie, the only thing we've agreed on so far is that we both want a fair trial for our client. You think it's possible. I don't. Uh, not yet, Paul. There's, uh, there's something I want to see again out of that TV coverage. Want to see the whole thing? No, I don't know. Just run it. I'll tell you where to stop. And cut the sound. What are we looking for? Well, now that we've been through it, we want to have a good look at everyone who was there that night. Anyone who might be able to tell us what happened. Now, hold it right there. Now, Paul, do you have these two guys straight? Seen the one on the right, Grady's son, Lenny. The fast talker's your friend, Vic Brandt. Yeah, my friend. Go ahead, Paul, run it. Oh, there, stop. It didn't occur to me before. Maggie, who's the truck driver? Don't recognize him, but that's one of Art Kruger's trucks. Who's Art Kruger? His outfit does all the trucking for Frank Hayden. Trucking. Yeah, I picked that up in the bar downstairs. Now, this Kruger is the fellow who was beaten up by Frank Hayden and ended up in the hospital. Hayden dead after sending Kruger to the hospital. Huh. Go ahead, Paul. Wait a minute, that guy looks familiar. A reporter? When the devil have I seen him before? Why, he was in front of the hotel when Vic Brandt... That's right. Yeah, he was in his car outside when we drove in. What next? First thing tomorrow, I want to see the murder site. I'd like to see Frank Hayden walk. Yeah. in that chair. Dead. said you'd be coming. Mr. Mason, I want you to know that it's not easy for me to help a man who... Well, I want to be fair. Thank you, Mrs. Hayden. Could you tell us about that evening when your husband left the house? Well, that's, that's the worst part. But it's like I caused it. You see, I bought Frank a present, a ring that I knew that he wanted. And I was hiding it until his birthday. And he was poking around, and he found it. Frank just wanted to know how I got the money. He didn't mean anything by it, you know? It was like he could tell that it was kind of expensive. Well, I just blew up. Well, he got awful mad. You were telling us about the ring. Oh, I, um... I can't say too much about that. I, I, Mr. Gomez wants me to tell in court. The deputy district attorney. So you argued and your husband left the house? Well, I, I was afraid for Frank. With all the commotion going on. Well, I felt real awful about fussing at him like that. So I phoned the office here. And Frank answered. And I apologized. And I begged him to come home and... And he promised that he would come just as soon as he'd finished with his book. But a minute or two after I hung up, I heard the shots. <laughs> I was sorry. Mrs. Hayden, do you have some coffee or something to drink? 
You come on up to the house. Now you and Della go ahead. I'll join you. Something else I can do for you? Did you hear any sounds before the shots? Voices, uh, door slam. Nope. It was real quiet after the pickets cooled off. Did you shoot at Grady Cobb? <laughs> no. Turned the dog loose. That was enough. The police report mentioned only warning shots fired into the air. I'd like to see that fence. Kruger's not here. Uh, I've only been on the job a couple of months. The guy you want to talk to is uh, Vic Brandt. Brandt? Yeah. He knows Kruger better than me. He used to drive with him, working for the Jackson Ranch. Until Vic got big ideas. Quit to be a fire-breathing labor organizer. Hey, where, um, where can I find Kruger? You got me. Nobody's seen him since the night Hayden got killed. Just up and walked out of the hospital. Shape he was in. Must have crawled out. He must have left here in his hospital gown. So I figure somebody picked him up. Otherwise, why wasn't he arrested for indecent exposure? So in the past two months, Kruger never sent for his clothes. Are you sure this is everything? It's all itemized. Uh-uh, mustn't take. Oh, wait a minute. Just received for a credit card charge if you some gas and oil. Well, you promised that you were only going to look. You see, I'm responsible for all this stuff. Well, I kind of had you figured as the incorruptible type this warrant, so I'm not going to insult you with a bribe. You figured wrong. Go on. Insult me? <laughs> Give me time. You know, when I find a beautiful girl who's also corruptible, I like to do it right. You know that guy that just got on the elevator? No. I saw him talking to the supervisor. Would you try to find out who he is and what he was talking to her about? Well, I don't really... Uh, Miss Warren, if you're really certain that you're corruptible, I'm ready with a bribe. What time do you get off? Nine. And I hate hamburgers and root beer. You're a man of your word, Paul Drake. You know why your father went to see Frank Hayden that night. And it wasn't to get his job back. Now, Lenny, tell me. I just can't. Why? Because Vic's given you your orders. Forget it, Maggie. Hey, hey man. Listen, honey. For your own good, it's better off that you know nothing. Thank you me. wanted to know about that man at the hospital this afternoon. His name's Carl Simpson. And he asked the same questions you did about Art Kruger. You know, Norma, I could kiss you for that. Tell you what, I've got a very short appointment. If you think you could uh, nurse that wine for a while, I'll be back within the hour. I'll consider it. I might even be here when you get back. I think you will. Norma? Did you get anything out of it? A Chateaubriand and some lovely wine. Hey, do you have Maggie working on Violent Victor and the cop kid? Why? Well, I saw the three of them down at the bar in heavy conversation. Here's the report. You want to go over what we have? Perry? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, first, two things. Now, the fellow I saw at the hospital is a guy by the name of Carl Simpson. Apparently, he has the same interest in Kruger as we have. Now, about Mr. Kruger. After I got his gasoline credit card number, a call gave me his billings for the past four months. Now, by coordinating the dates, I was able to plot his route from the time he left the hospital. Last stop, San Diego. And that was more than two weeks ago. What's this note after the last San Diego billing? Kincaid's Garage and Service. Ten charges there for the past three months. 
which means that Kruger was a regular customer. At a small out-of-the-way town. Near the Mexican border. I've got some of my people from San Diego working on it now. That's not good enough, Paul. I want you to go there yourself. Okay. Dollar, he'll need the charter plane in the morning. I'll call. What time? Early. Call me as soon as you get anything. Preferably our crew. Now listen, Della Beautiful, I got some unfinished business at the bar. So uh, why don't you have a call at the desk for me, huh? Say 6 a.m.? Good night. Yes, Carl Simpson, room 243. I'd like to leave a wake-up call. Six in the morning. You think it's time you let me in on whatever it is you know that I don't? I know that Grady's going to have a tough time getting a fair trial, and I told you that right from the start. You were with Lenny Cobb and Vic Brandt last night. You felt it was so important to know why Grady went to see Hayden. I asked them. They don't know. Maggie, we're going in there to try a murder case, together. Now you're holding out on me. You may not think so, but I'm a lawyer, and a pretty good one. I'll do what's best for the client. I've kept nothing back. There is nothing more to tell you. I came here this morning, and I see you talking to Lenny and Vic. I see sheriff's deputies with rifles. I see this crowd demonstrating, pushing in. All right. There's supposed to be a demonstration. In the courtroom. Just to show that Grady Cobb has friends behind him. You have to make noises these days. Let them hear you, otherwise... Maggie, we want a fair trial, not a circus. We're lawyers, not ringmasters. They start raising hell in there, the judge simply clears the court, and that's it. The whole idea is futile. See you in court. Another argument with Maggie? No. The same one. Let's go. Finally, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the people will recall for you that one grim moment when the defendant, Grady Cobb, was caught with the blood of his victim still fresh on his hands. He was shaking like a leaf. His hands and clothes were all bloody. He was scrambling for the fence. Then what happened? And the deputies moved in. I hauled the dog off. The deputy took Grady away. I went back into the office. That's when I found the gun on the floor. Your witness, counsel. Mr. McDonald, do you recognize this revolver, People's Exhibit 2? It's Frank Hayden's, or it was. It's the one he kept in his desk drawer. Then you knew where the gun was kept. <laughs> Everybody knew. Boss made darn sure we did. He kept a lot of cash in the office. Didn't want anyone messing in the till. The way Grady did before. Your Honor, I move to strike the last remark as unresponsive. The reporter will strike the last part of the answer. The jury will disregard it. Mr. McDonald, you were near the building for some time before the shots fired. Did you hear a lot of noise at that time from the pickets? You no, know, most of them took off after the boss went in. Those that stayed just carried signs, hardly talked. Now, Mr. McDonald, did you hear or see any shots fired at the defendant when he attempted to climb the fence? Heard someone fire to warn him. Did you see a bullet impact in the fence post? Hmm. You know, I, I seen what you're talking about, but it didn't look especially like any bullet to me. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. No redirect, Your Honor. You may step down. Call your next witness, Mr. Gomez. The people call Lori Hayden. Mrs. Hayden, will you tell the court in your own words the events leading up to the purchase of this ring? Oh, well, I wanted to get Frank something special for his birthday, and I decided on that ring. But the trouble was, I didn't have enough money to buy it. And, 
Well, not with the allowance that Frank gave me. I don't mean that he was tight-fisted. He was just careful with money. I'll have order in this court. Please go on, Mrs. Hayden. Well, I couldn't just ask Frank for it outright like that. I mean, for his own gift. So I did what I usually did when I needed a few dollars extra. I borrowed it from his petty cash box. <laughs> now, I'll have proper behavior from the spectators or I'll clear the courtroom. Continue, Mr. Gomez. What happened after you took the money, Mrs. Hayden? Well, everything got all mixed up. The first thing I knew, Frank had poor Grady Cobb locked up for taking it. Did you tell your husband the truth? No, by the time I worked up the nerve to, it was too late. Grady Cobb was already in jail for something he didn't even do. And I know that he held it against Frank, but it was really my fault. I'm the one who was to blame. Objection! The question calls for a conclusion. The answer is not responsive, and I move to strike. Objection sustained. Strike the question and the answer. The jury will disregard. Take the witness. Get a copy of Frank Hayden's death certificate, and if possible, Art Kruger's records from the hospital. Your Honor, the defense has no cross at this time, but requests the right to recall this witness. All right, Counselor. Get on with it, Mr. Gomez. Thank you, Mrs. Hayden. The people call Victor Brandt and ask if he designated a hostile witness, Your Honor. Objection, you it, Your Honor. Honor. While I'm understanding. The witness is a person of It's Grady's only chance. Can't help it, buddy. I'm scared out of my skull. You've got more guts than any guy I know. Come on, you can make it. Order, order. truth and nothing but the truth? Yeah. Be seated, please. State your name, please. Victor Brandt. And when you say I'm hostile, that means I don't care for you or your kind. You ought to be with us instead of acting like a Chicano Uncle Tom. The witness will confine himself to answering the questions. I'll not have this trial turned into a farce. Isn't that what it's already become? An out and out attempt to railroad an honest man. Yeah. Yeah. Free my father! Yeah. Free Grady Cobb! Free Grady Cobb! Free Grady Cobb! I have order in this courtroom. Free Grady Cobb! Free Grady Cobb! Order! Order! Mr. Brandt, you are standing on the verge of contempt. If you indulge in any more grandstand oratory, I'll see that you're given sufficient time in jail to prepare your speech. Proceed, Mr. Gomez. Mr. Brand, do you recall breaking up a fight between the defendant and Frank Hayden when Hayden accused him of stealing? All I remember is that Frank Hayden treated Grady Cobb the way he treated everybody else, like property. And that's why we organized against him, and that's why we hit him and the big growers right where it hurts in the pocketbook. We're not looking for an organizing speech now, Mr. Brandt, just a simple answer. Now, Mr. Brandt, we're here to learn the facts of the case, to see that justice is done. There's only one kind of justice here. The kind that sent Grady Cobb to jail when he didn't do anything. The kind that's now trying to send him to prison for a murder he never committed. Now, the only justice we're going to get here is with these. Our bare feet! <laughs>
listen to me. I don't want to hurt anybody. But I will if I have to. Let me. Just everybody stay cool now. You're fixing to get yourself killed. Let's go, Pop. You out of your mind, boy. Lenny. Shut up. Come on, we gotta move now. Lenny, you're not making sense. Now, when this trial is over, your father can walk out of here. I'm not letting him railroad him again. He's gonna be free. I'm doing this for you, Pop. What you've been doing and what you're doing now is not for me. It's for him. Then there's his words coming out of your mouth. Drop that gun belt. Stop it. Get him. Bloody! Oh. It's not like it was before with Vic. This gun's loaded. Don't be a darn fool, Pop. You want to go back to jail for the rest of your life? Pop! You're going to have to shoot this darn fool to get him out of here. Then she's coming. Let it, let it get go! Get back, Mason! Lenny. No. The guy's gonna come for me with the chopper. Then if they let me go, I'll let you go. You're not gonna kill me. You know you're not. Just shut up! We can just shut up. I gotta think. Think? Nothing more to think about, Mr. Mason. Under the circumstances, a mistrial is the answer. If you declare a mistrial, it will have to be over the objections of the defense. The law in such a I matter. I know the law. And I strongly recommend that you concur that a mistrial be granted. Well, considering the events, if Your Honor would allow a recess after which we resume the trial, then if, in my opinion, a fair verdict appears impossible, I'll move for the mistrial. Well, it seems to me the defendant's rights have been prejudiced. But if Mr. Mason wants to go ahead and Your Honor will keep the option open, I'll go along with the arrangement. Well, all right. For now, I'll instruct the jury and let the trial proceed. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Your Honor. You know, it's a good thing the defendant refused to go with his son. If he had, all this would be academic. What do you mean? The sheriff had an anonymous call this morning, a tip to watch out for Lenny Cobb's pickup truck. They had it staked out. If Lenny had taken his father out there, they might both be dead. I don't know what you're getting at, Mr. Mason. I mean, I'm not the smartest fellow in the world, Brady, but... don't give me any more of that. Now, what did you have on Frank Hayden that made you so certain all you had to do was walk in there, threaten him, and you'd get your job back? Well, I told you all that right from the beginning. I know what you told me, and I don't believe it. Now, how can I defend you if you don't tell me the truth? 
Well, it's my life. It's also Lenny's life and Maggie's life. Now, why did you really go out to see Frank Hayden that night? Well, it was about something I heard about Frank Hayden and Vic Brandt while I was in jail. Why Vic keeps them fellas out on strike all the time. But you thought Lenny was mixed up in it because he was a friend of Vic's? That's right. Did you talk to Lenny about that when they let you out of jail? <laughs> I tried to, but he wouldn't listen. He thinks that Vic a new prophet Elijah. So you went out to see Frank Hayden that night? Just, just to talk to him. To tell him if he'd have Vic keep Lenny out of it, I wouldn't say a word to nobody. I'd keep quiet. But if he wouldn't... Well, anyway, I never, never had a chance to talk to him. He was dead? Yep. So you ran and someone took a shot at you? That's how it was. And this time I'm telling you gospel. I'm going out to try to talk Lenny into giving up. I want you to come with me. And help you? Help your friend. Just what do you expect me to do? Keep Lenny from getting killed. I'm butting out, Mason. Vic, I thought you were the leader around here. So? Don't you want to help Lenny? There won't be a helicopter. There never was going to be one. You know that by now. So what happens? Do you try to make a break for it and get us both killed? Or when they try to come in here, do you... Do you shoot me? Sergeant, gonna borrow your bullhorn. Lenny, this is Perry Mason. I've got your friend Vic with me. I knew he'd come. Vic will figure things out. We're coming in, Lenny. We're not armed. We just want to talk. Let's go. Tell you what you're going to do, Lenny. You give me that gun and we'll go back down these stairs. No. No, see, I let you come up here so I could talk to him, not you. Well, what do you want to do? Give your friend another chance to set you up as he did this morning? <laughs> what are you talking about? The day Grady finished his sentence, he told you about Vic and Frank Hayden, but you didn't believe him, did you? My father lied. He couldn't stand Vic and me having any kind of... You wouldn't believe him, but you believed Vic when he denied it. It's garbage, Lenny. Vic also knew the only way to keep it quiet was to get rid of your father. And you. The night Frank Hayden was killed, someone took a shot at your father. He's just trying to get us at each other's throat, Lenny. No. You had a pistol that night. Whose idea was it for you to pull a gun in the courtroom and take your father out? Yours or Vic's? He's admitted it was Vic's idea. Did anyone else besides you two know what you were going to do? No. Then only Vic could have tipped off the sheriff's deputies and had them waiting outside the court, watching your truck. Yeah. <laughs> Krueger? Yeah. Paul Drake, private investigator. 
Well, if you knew how many podunk airports I've flown into, how many rusty tin roof garages I've checked out in order to catch up with you. Yeah, for what? We want you to testify in a murder trial back in Greenbrier. I can't even hear you. Now, look, there's a subpoena out for you as a material witness. So I'll make this thing easy for yourself. And don't make a problem out of it. There won't be a problem, Mr. Drake. So what in the devil are you? My name is Carl Simpson. I'm a special investigator for the Department of Immigration and Naturalization, Western Division. You said you're a special investigator. Isn't illegal immigration a routine problem? That's right. Some of it's always going on. But I'm heading up this special investigation because since the labor trouble, we estimate that well over 5,000 Mexican nationals have been brought in illegally to work the fields. Have you determined how this smuggling ring operates? Yes, sir. The aliens pay $100 for transportation, 20% of their pay to get in. Now that means that in this valley alone, the smugglers have made in excess of $1 million. Can you tell us if any person or persons in Greenbrier are a part of this racket? For one, the deceased in this case, Frank Hayden. We're certain he was heavily involved. In what way? On the receiving end, as a source of cheap strike breakers. The aliens were driven up from Baja, California, and they were usually hidden in produce trucks. Mr. Simpson, have you identified the operators of any of these trucks? Yes, sir. They were hired by Mr. Arthur Kruger. Okay, so we hauled the wetbacks over the border. But we took better care of them than the Caritas did. They had three squares a day, clean clothes, and a dry place to sleep. They never had it so good. All right, now, Mr. Kruger, we're less interested in your philanthropy than in your whereabouts on the night of the murder. Well, I told you, I got uh, Conway to drive me back to the ranch to pick up my gear. To confront Frank Hayden? Oh, no. no Hayden was the last guy I wanted to confront after the brawl I had with him. Put me in the hospital. What was the brawl about? That was a little difference of opinion over business. I took all the risks, and uh, he took the biggest cut of all. As long as the strike went on and the union workers stayed out, Frank Hayden was getting rich. So it was to Hayden's advantage, and yours, to keep the strike going. Oh, that's for sure. How did you manage it? Well, Frank took care of that. Uh, we paid a lot and prayed a lot. Well, I don't know who was on the take. Were you on the take? No. The only reason we stayed out was to win a better contract. Now, nobody with any sense would ever take a wild story like that seriously. Well, if, as you say, it's a wild story, why did someone take it serious enough to make two separate attempts on Grady Cobb's life to keep him from telling that? Wild story. You're not getting to me. Oh, I'm getting to you, Mr. Brandt. Someone who wanted Grady Cobb dead made an anonymous phone call that put sheriff's deputies outside this courthouse. Someone who wanted him dead fired at Grady Cobb the night of the murder. I don't know anything about it. I remind you that Lenny Cobb knows the answer to the question I'm going to put to you. And he will, in time, be available to testify. I also remind you that you're under oath. Now. Were you carrying a gun the night of the murder? I have the right to protect myself. Did you carry a gun that night? All I'm admitting is that I had a gun. Did you use that gun, Mr. Brandt? No. Mr. Kruger's told us that he had a business argument with Frank Hayden earlier. Were you a part of that argument, Mr. Brandt? No. <laughs> that wasn't any business argument either. Now, we have a witness who can tell us about that argument, Mr. Brandt. Your Honor, the defense requests the court to instruct this witness to remain available for recall to the stand. The bailiff will detain the witness when Mr. Kruger, at the request of federal authorities. Thank you, Your Honor. Your witness, Mr. Gomez. No questions. The defense calls Mrs. Frank Hayden. Well, yes, I did overhear part of the argument that Frank had with Mr. Kruger. It had something to do with business. I don't really remember. I see. All right, Mrs. Hayden, maybe I can help prod your memory a bit. You've already testified that you ordered this ring as a birthday gift for your husband. Isn't that correct? Yes. Would you describe the ring for the court, please? Uh, it's a, a kind of a reddish color. Now, wouldn't it be more accurate to say it's a garnet, the traditional birthstone for the month of January? I guess, uh-huh. Garnet. But according to his death certificate, 
Your husband was born in November, so his birthstone would have been a topaz. Oh, well, I don't know anything about stones. I just picked that ring because I like the color. Isn't it a fact, Mrs. Hayden, that you didn't buy the ring for your husband at all? That you bought it for someone who was born in January? No. It's for sure I don't have a relative in the world worth a $200 ring. I suggest you didn't want to tell your husband about the ring, not because it was a surprise for him or a relative. It was a surprise for Arthur B. Kruger, who, according to his record at the hospital, was born January 3rd, 1935. There was never anything between Art and me. Isn't it a fact, Mrs. Hayden, that your husband knew there was, and that's why he fought with Arthur Kruger? Who killed your husband? Did you do it yourself, or did you have someone do it for you? I... I called the hospital that night, and Art wasn't in his room. And I knew what he was going to do. He'd wanted to do it for a long time, and I was scared. Yes, I was cheating on Frank. I was cheating on him, but... Murder! I'd never do anything like that. I... Is that why you phoned your husband that night? Yes, and he wouldn't even listen to me. He wouldn't talk to me. He just called me a dirty little tramp, and then he hung up. And how long was that before you heard the shots? A minute. Maybe two. I knew that Art had done it, but I... She's lying. I was never near that office. Well, we know she's lying, Mr. Kruger. Aren't you, Mrs. Hayden? No. You lied about the ring, you lied about the affair, you lied about the petty cash, and you're lying now. Because witness after witness has testified they were in the immediate vicinity of that office from the time your husband entered it until the shots were fired. And Mrs. Hayden, none of them heard a sound. Oh. None of them heard the phone ring with a call you lied about. Oh, no. No, you're making a mistake. You, you... No, you made the mistake. When you took that gun from your husband's desk, waited behind the back door and killed him in cold blood. And you can't tell us that's a lie, Mrs. Hayden. No, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> The bailiff will escort the witness from the stand. I can't help but feel for that woman. She'll get a fair trial. You sure about that? I'm sure. 